Hi, I'm Heidi Raphael, co-chair for the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation. And I'm Jack Goodman, the other co-chair of the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation. And we would like to welcome you to the LABF Power Session. In this module, you'll get a look into a few of the library's prized collections from BMI, Westinghouse, and many others with LAB's reference specialist, Mike Henry. Next, learn about podcasting and hear some tips on how to produce a successful podcast with Ron Shapiro, head of production for Spotify's podcast division. Then, get an overview of imaging and how to produce promos, sweepers, and other station imaging elements from Thomas Green, Benstown's Director of Custom Imaging. Later, Shane Drazen, an ASCAP award-winning composer and head of composition for Benstown, shows you how to compose and produce production music. And finally, find out what it's like to own a radio station with Jeff Smullyan, founder and CEO of MS Communications. Hello, my name is Michael Henry and I am with the Library of American Broadcasting at the University of Maryland. As I've spoken previously, the Library of American Broadcasting is an archive devoted to the history of radio and television broadcasting. Today I'm going to give you even more specific examples of some of the resources I gave you hints to the last time I spoke to you. So, for example, in our books and pamphlet collection, which covers all aspects of radio and television broadcasting from the 1920s to the present, one of the most fascinating and informative publications we have are annual reports. Annual reports that were published every year to report on the activities of a particular network or broadcast organization. Here you see the annual report for CBS from 1952. And other examples of annual reports we have are from CBS, NBC, ABC, the National Association of Broadcasters, um, RCA, and other companies that produced broadcast programming or broadcasting equipment. Now, you see here a CBS annual report. So I thought I would give you sort of a tour through these resources by using CBS as an example. So magazines. So I mentioned before that one of the, the most interesting kinds of magazines that we have, in addition to trade publications and academic journals, are fan magazines. The magazines that the average listener or television viewer would find at the newsstand to learn more about their favorite performers and shows. So one of the longest running and most prominent ones, and certainly the, uh, one of the most interesting and best illustrated ones, was called Radio Mirror which over time became Radio and Television Mirror, depending on the era. So here we have an example from 1954 uh, showing Ozzie and Harriet, who, was, who were a prominent CBS performer, performers and program. So it had articles, and photographs, program listings, you know, personal stories about their family life or their working life on the air. It was published from 1933 to 1977, so it really covers the really golden age of radio and television broadcasting from the 30s all the way into the 70s, so it gives a great view of, of the whole scope of broadcast history. We also have personal collections, collections that were collected by people in the industry. Their, their photographs, their, their letters, their fan mail, their awards, their scripts, their recordings, so it gives intimate first-hand insight into their lives and careers, which are indispensable to researching any time period in broadcast history. So, for example, at the Library of American Broadcasting, we like to highlight women and other demographics that have been traditionally been overlooked by broadcast historians for any number of reasons. So, one of our favorite collections are the papers of Helen Sousa, who was an actual director and executive at CBS from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, in charge of their talks and public affairs programming, where she was able to direct and interact with some of the most influential men and women in the political and social spheres of that time period. Such as in this photograph, she is directing former President Herbert Hoover in an upcoming address over the CBS network. And this collection has letters and photographs and audio recordings and personal uh, papers that give her that give 
biographical information about her. So it's an incredible collection giving insight into this early woman executive at a national network. So here's another collection, personal collection that documents a, radio, a particular radio program that aired on the CBS network. It was a radio interview program called Vox Pop. During the 30s and 40s, it traveled around the country interviewing men and women from all walks of life. And during the World War II, they interviewed civilians and military personnel, as well as defense plant workers. So these, and the men that you see in the photograph interviewing Captain Richard Hathaway, collect, saved an incredible amount of material that gives detailed information about this program and how it was run, including program, program logs documenting every single broadcast and the details. Photo, over 2,000 photographs that were taken during the broadcast, as you see here, you see one example, and also audio recordings of the actual broadcast themselves. We also have, in addition to the photographs that are contained in the Vox Pop collection and the Helen Sousa collection, we also have the photo archive to Broadcasting and Cable magazine, which since 1931 has been one of the most prominent and influential broadcasting trade publications. It, since that time, it's been on the desks of radio and television personalities and personnel every week. So it documents over time has done incredible work at documenting and reporting on the activities of the broadcasting industry. So here you see a photograph of CBS correspondent Edward R. Murrow with Paul White, the director of CBS News in the 30s and 40s, whose vision and working with Murrow and other CBS correspondents like Robert Trout and, and Howard K. Smith really brought radio news into prominence during World War II. And in this collection, we have over 300,000 photographs dating from 1931. Entertainment personalities, but also executives, political figures, anyone who would have been reported on by Broadcasting Cable magazine. So it's an incredible collection, again, documenting a wide scope of broadcast broadcasting history. And with Every photograph, you can see so many details and insights into the, the people who worked in broadcasting or the programs or the technology that they used. So as you see here, you see a CBS microphone on, on Paul White's desk, and, which is obviously a stage photograph, but it does give you great insight into perhaps their working relationship. So in addition to photographs, we also have a visual medium of film and video. So one of our most prominent Entertainment entertainer collections is that of Arthur Godfrey, who was a, a popular entertainer and host on early radio and television. We have his papers, which include over 300 kinescope films that recorded his television programs, such as T Town Scouts, Arthur Godfrey and His Friends. And due to generous funding, we've been able to digitize 10 of those kinescope films from 1952 and 1953, which can actually be seen on our digital collections portal on site here at the University of Maryland. And lastly, we have audio recordings. Now, unlike the Arthur Godfrey recordings, this is not a CBS broadcast program. This is from the Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, which was owned by the Westinghouse Company. And these are actual audio recordings of their radio news broadcasts. We have over 2,000 audio tapes dating from 1957 to 1982, documenting all the major social and political events of that time period, including the Civil Rights Movement, the Space Race, the Vietnam War, Watergate, and the various political assassinations that took place during those times. And Again, due to generous funding, we've been able to digitize about 600 of those tapes to make them available on our website. And now this collection can actually be heard from any location, from any website portal, wherever a researcher may be, and does not necessarily have to be viewed on site at the University of Maryland. So I hope these descriptions of these various resources and examples of the kinds of material that we have will perhaps inspire you to come up with some ideas for your own research or your own programming. 
and I'll be ha- more than happy to talk to you more about these resources and others I, I did not mention. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. My name is Thomas. I'm the uh, Director of Custom Imaging at Benstown, uh, and I'm excited today to walk you through what radio imaging is, why the term can sometimes be confusing, but what exactly it is, uh, and why I think it's the most exciting part in all of radio as far as creating audio, creating something unique, and bringing products to life. Imaging is the color in radio. It's the energy that you as a producer can bring to a show, can bring to a station, can bring to a podcast. It's however you want to utilize your skill set in creating sound that you can apply with your team to a product that brings it to life. Uh, So as I've written here, it's about utilizing the immense power of sound for a maximum emotional response from your audience, from your listeners. Uh, Let's walk through what exactly audio imaging is. Uh, An important distinction between two areas that are often confused, um, there's a big difference between sound design and audio imaging, um, but often they're seen as the same uh, product, same process. Sound design is the functional process, the uh, building of the sound. So it includes acquiring audio work parts, including music, voiceovers, audio clips from say movies or any old TV shows or whatever the case and sampling. Uh, After acquiring those audio work parts, it it involves recording, editing, mixing, mastering, all of the elements together to create a finished audio product that someone, a listener will end up hearing and consuming. So I like to think of the sound design as the what. Um, Audio imaging compared to sound design is the creative process. So creating sounds that elicit an emotional response from the audience. So not the functional process, but the creative why behind something. It includes building identifiable sounds or sonic IDs. I'll get into that in a sec. Um, Creating an audio environment that conveys emotion where, you know, if you've got a horror soundtrack for a horror film that conveys suspense and fear, if you're, making a summer concert promotion to put on air a promo that runs for 30 seconds or a minute, then it's going to be upbeat. It's going to have people cheering. It might have splashing sound effects for water if it's near a beach, you know, clinking of glasses for a drink or whatever the case. um, But sound that resonates with an audience that hopefully they'll want to return for more. And fundamentally, it's how when we produce our audio, how they perceive the product we're selling to them. Um, or creating for them. Um, so that's why I like to think of sound design as the what and audio imaging as the why. Uh, a good analogy that I like to use for this is a bottle of Coke, a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, the sound design is the equivalent of being in the factory, using raw ingredients, the sugar, the plastics for the case, uh, the bottle to create an end product, the raw product. Um, the audio imaging is the equivalent of how the product will be received and consumed, whether branding, whether in commercials, whether uh, on post-it, you know, how the product, what that people associate Coca-Cola with as far as relaxation, good times, enjoying life, the, uh, the joy that you can find from what is just a beverage, but how we as the consumer find joy in that product. Um, I wanna play for you just a few seconds, the uh, Netflix, Tadam Sonic ID, which is perhaps one of the most recognizable current uh, Sonic ID logos. So it's like the audio equivalent of the Coca-Cola branding for Netflix. So I'll play that now. The purpose of all of this is to build a loyal audience, know who you're communicating an idea or a feeling to, um, and to create something special. The necessary tools for audio imaging, um, similar to what you might have seen from uh, people doing composition and music on their computers. You just need a computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, uh, a digital audio workstation, a DAW. I use Pro Tools. I find that the most powerful for what I need. Uh, plugins, 
are the pieces of software that you can use in Pro Tools. So Waves, Isotope, different things for mixing, mastering, EQ, compression, uh, time stretching, whatever the case. Access to audio files. Now this one is a bit of a uh, bit of a wider sort of open basket. Like wherever you get, if you have um, access to production libraries, uh, whoever your voiceover is, where you get your song files from, um, and any sound effects you have. This is uh, fairly unique. The process that people tend to go through, but by far the best place to start is getting your hands on a wonderful production library, access to a production library like Ben's Downs, because um, going from there, the world's your oyster. Um, and lastly, a love of audio. You've got to love what you do. You've got to enjoy the creative process um, and finding the end result, because sometimes it can take time to get there. I wanted to play about 30 seconds to a minute of audio examples for you. So um, this is just a music promo. Hot. Wiltbar and Scranton's newest station. It's hot. Ooh, I love it when you do it like that. Northeast PA's hottest music. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. The station's hot. This is the new Hot 97.1. On air, on Alexa, and on the official Hot 97.1 app. Hopefully you can hear through that and the mixing and the use of song hooks and the changing of ideas what the station is trying to convey as far as what they play, their music playlists, the energy they bring, uh, and what tuning in will bring you as far as your uh, consumption process, enjoying what they have. Um, the power of audio, as I was saying before, uh, perhaps the strongest form of communication we have for eliciting an emotional response. Uh, as an audio producer, when you're using, when you're doing custom imaging, whether you're hitting hard with big sounds or you're utilizing silence for impact in really creative ways, audio is immensely powerful and it's unlimited in the ways you can make it powerful. Uh, the most important things I find are knowing who your audience is, knowing the format you're working with, knowing the station you're providing imaging for, knowing who's listening, the demographics, all of that. Understanding what you sound like to them is really crucial because sometimes you can get in your own head when you're mixing, but understanding how it sounds on the other end is really important. Never stop learning or never stop listening to new ideas, new ways to be creative, um, because that will guide you to continue to be better. Thanks very much. Reach out anytime if you have any questions or um, just want to talk about audio imaging. Um, I appreciate your time. Thanks. So my name is Shane Drayson. I'm a composer here at Benstown. And today we're going to talk about music composition. Um, music is the universal language. No matter what language you speak, music still speaks to your five senses. Music can tell a story without words, from spooky to happy, sad to romantic, dramatic or energetic. We can really paint the picture for how a listener imagines or watches things. Certain types of music can be more dramatic in situations we wouldn't expect. For example, in a horror film, when 50s doo-wop music plays over a scene that is actually spooky or suspenseful. This can have more of an impact than something that's more typical. If you're interested in getting started in music production, here's a list of things that you will need. You'll need a good DAW, digital audio workstation like Pro Tools, Logic, Ableton Live, Cubase Reason, a good audio interface. I like the Universal Audio Apollos. Um, a couple of microphones to, recu to record acoustic sources like guitars or vocals. Um, some software instruments with specific sound libraries that you would want, like maybe you want an orchestral library or some rock drums or bass. Um, there's many different things that you could research for those. Um, some acoustic instruments, um, some, maybe some drums, acoustic guitars, horns. Plugins that help you achieve the sounds you're after, like EQs, compressors, reverbs, and mastering software like Isotope Ozone or Brainworks MasterDesk. Those are great as well. Um, here's a couple of pictures of my guitars. Um, like I said, I use Pro Tools, and I use a thing called a Kemper for my guitars, which models amplifiers. What it does is you can actually take snapshots of your amplifier in a, a sonic snapshot. So what that means is you put a microphone in front of your amp and the Kemper system takes a snapshot of your amp's sound and then you store it. Then you can have that sound anywhere you go. 
And there's lots of things that do this now. There's the Line 6 Helix. There's plugins that do this. Um, Universal Audio does it. Um, and then here, I'm going to show you a screenshot of one of my sessions. So what I do is I use a session template. So when I open Pro Tools, everything's ready to go. It's almost like you're walking into a complete recording studio because I set it up in the way that I have my drum track loaded, I have drum software, I have plugins ready to go, I have my guitar tracks ready to go. Almost like a tape player would be just ready there to record you. So I, I never start with a blank session because then you're, you're starting from the ground up. But if everything's there and ready to go, you could just start right away and you know, capture your creative ideas. Um, so what I do is I make music beds. And a music bed is a bed of music that lays underneath voiceover or podcast or anything that's playing above it. A music bed structure is about two minutes. I always start with a little intro. I go right to the chorus, verse, chorus again, a bridge, a breakdown, then the final chorus, which is like the biggest chorus of the thing, and then we end it. Here's another shot of my, my template. So when I open Pro Tools, this is what it looks like. I have plugins loaded and mastering is already set ready to go. Um, and then I'm going to show you a picture of the Benstown libraries that I composed for. Here's all the different libraries, AC, CHR, Classic Hits, Country. Any given day I'm doing any different style. So there's days where I'm, I'm going from, you know, doing country to hip hop. It's all over the place. And that's what keeps it fun. It keeps it, um, you know, it keeps it fresh all the time. It's not like I'm always doing one thing. It's, it's, uh, keeps the creative juices flowing. And then when you go into the library, this is the music bed section, we do four different mix outs of the music bed. So mix out A would be the full version, mix out B would be the light version, mix out C would be drums and bass, and mix out D would be drums only. And here you could download any one you want, and mix them up the way you ever want to use them. And other than that, I say let the music guide the way. You know, you do what's best for the song. Sometimes we could add too much or, you know, overplay. I always like to just listen to what I'm making and see what the song really needs. And I don't, I don't tend to overplay parts or make things too busy, especially if you're thinking about voiceovers so that's going to be on top of it. Thanks again. My name is Shane Drayson. I'm the music composer here at Benstown. And feel free to reach out to me. My email address is sd at benstown.com if you have any questions. Hi, I'm Ron Shapiro. I'm Spotify's head of production for exclusives and creator production. I'm here today to talk about podcasting. So what do you need to start a podcast? Well, Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, had a philosophy for business that also applies to podcasting. Three simple things. Know your product better than anyone. Know your customer and have a burning desire to succeed. And of course, your product is your podcast or the subject matter and your customer are, is the listener. So before you get started, find your why. It's important to take a step back and ask yourself, why do I want to do a podcast in the first place? Tell the sto story only you can. You have a perspective that few other people on the planet have. So really lean into it and stick with it. In addition to getting the word out about your podcast and advertising or however you're getting the word out, the biggest growth for your podcast happens within about four months. So don't be discouraged if it doesn't pop right off the bat. And what type of podcast do you want to do? Well, the most popular genres are comedy, news, true crime, or sports. But if your passion is finance, do finance. You're always going to do better with something that you really have a passion for. So uh, this slide talks about sports, health and fitness, religion, faith, politics. All of those are valid. They all have a large audience. So stick with the passion that you have. And who listens to podcasts? Well, about half the listeners between the ages of 35 and 44, and about 22% of listeners 55 plus listen on a monthly basis. That's a lot of people. By the way, female listenership reached an all-time high back in 2021. And people aged 12 to 34, they make up the majority. About two-thirds of podcast fans within America listen uh, to podcasts. 43% of the U.S. men and 39% of U.S. women listen to podcasts. And two-thirds of listeners have a college degree, bachelor's or higher, with an average annual income of about $75,000 or more. And also one-fourth of Americans 55-plus listen to podcasts on a monthly basis. So there are a lot of people that can listen to your podcast. 
So don't be discouraged with these numbers. Yes, there are over 5 million podcasts and over 70 million episodes between them. But 62% of the people in the U.S. have listened to a podcast at least once, and there are about 465 million podcast listeners globally as of January of 2023. But it's predicted that about 505 million podcast listeners worldwide by the end of 2024. So that's a huge increase in a very short time. By contrast, back in 2019, there were only about 275 million podcast listeners. So you can really see the growth, and there is room for you. And the popularity of spoken word audio has also really increased. Spoken word's share of audio listening has risen 45% between the years of 2014 and 2022. There's been a 25% increase in listeners in the U.S. from that same period. And Gen Z, well, they spend 22% of their listening time on spoken word, compared to just about 9% of that same age group back in 2014. That's 214% growth. Growth is still really, really happening. So you have the idea for the podcast. You know what you want to do. You have an idea about the competition. But something that's really important is that audio quality matters. Use quality microphones and recording equipment when possible. And 79% of podcast listeners tune in on their smartphones. So if your podcast combines music and voice mixed together, it's important that you do your mix on headphones. Because if you mix on speakers, chances are the people that are listening, the majority of people that are listening, the music will overwhelm your voice and your message will get lost. So keep the majority in mind. And I also want to mention that using a script or an outline is crucial. It's almost impossible to have compelling content without show prep. It's the same in broadcasting as it is in podcasting. And get your piece of the pie. U.S. podcasting advertising revenues are expected to hit $2.74 billion in 2025. That's a lot of money on the table. You should definitely get your share. Again, I've been Ron Shapiro. Thank you for watching. And I am Spotify's head of production, exclusives, and creator production. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff Smalley, and today I'm going to talk to you for LABF about owning a radio station and what is entailed, what you need to know, what you need to think about, and hopefully some tips in buying a radio station, running a radio station, and all that's entailed in the process. So the the first thing would be the CEO responsibilities. If you own a radio station, if you run a radio company, what are the most important responsibilities you have? The first is the strategic day-to-day, figuring out exactly what you want out of the business, what your goals are, how you go about putting the business together to maximize your economic interest. Um, That starts, to me, always with creating the proper culture, finding people, giving them the tools to make them successful. I have a favorite saying, I've never known anyone who ever came into work and wanted to screw up their job. So as managers, as owners, our job is to give our people the tools so that they can be successful. And I've always felt that it's the right culture. It's a culture that takes care of people, that's committed to your people, and that makes sure that they understand that as you win, they win. So to me, owning a radio station, running a radio station, really running any business, starts with creating the proper culture and building your leadership team. Find the people around you. Um, Most managers struggle in delegating. And I can tell you that if you're going to run a business, you have to learn how to delegate. You have to give the people around you the empowerment to run their business, to run their segment, and, and let them do their job without micromanaging them. In terms of what an FCC license is, um, you need to understand that Almost all licenses are bought and sold now. There are not many licenses that are new grants. Now, 100 years ago, everything was granted by the government, but over time, those stations have, have you know, traded hands a number of times. So when you acquire a license, usually through buying one, you first have to understand what your responsibilities are. Um, The fundamental rule is serving in the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Now, you might ask, what exactly is that? And it merely is operating in the best interest of your community, always understanding what the interest of the community is, 
Uh, I always think it's becoming engaged in your community, uh, being involved in the civic life, in the charitable life of the community, and providing a valuable service to the listeners and the advertisers in your community. Obviously, it also means being compliant with all FCC rules. Um, the FCC rules are not that onerous. Obviously, uh, you know, obscenity, uh, you, can't, you, you can't run fraudulent contests, you can't engage in fraudulent billing. Um, pretty much being a good citizen, uh, the FCC rules are quite clear. Uh, and I think if you just do your job and, and do the right things with the business, uh, you won't get in, in trouble with the FCC. But you always have to remember that you are licensed by the federal government uh, and have to comply with their rules. I guess the most important thing is people want to know, well, how do I do this? How do I buy a, a license? Um, I think the first thing you do is you have to find a station you want to buy. Um, and usually you'll talk to brokers. You may have friends who have a station that want to sell it, or you talk to brokers, and they always know stations for sale. Um, and so first thing is find what you want to buy. And then the next thing is obviously create your business plan. I think absolutely essential for everyone who ever buys any business to have a plan. How is it going to work? Um, how are we going to make the numbers work? Uh, I've always said it, it's fairly easy to borrow money. Banks have one rule. If, if they lend you money, they really have an expectation to get paid back. So your job is to make sure you have a business plan that's successful, that pays off your lenders uh, and pays off your other shareholders, provides you know capital for your other shareholders. Um, in, in creating your business plan, understanding exactly how this is going to work, um, you also need to find investors. Very few people start by buying their own state radio station unless you have massive funds at your disposal. Most people have limited resources and they have to find other investors. And the way you get other investors is you show them your business plan, you show them how you're going to make the business work, um, and if you get investors on board, then you go out and find a lender. Usually if you have investors that provide enough equity, um, then you will be able to find a lender, and then you will be able to put together a package to make an offer for a radio station. So those are just the basics, but the most important thing is if you find a radio station you love, put a business plan together to find out how you're going to make it work. Um, I think the most important thing that I can give you in terms of advice, um, I, I've written a book called Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down, which will go into great detail about what it's like to own a radio station, what it's like to start a group, what it's like to deal with all of the challenges you'll face. Um, the most important thing I can tell you is be prepared for adversity. Nobody's business is ever a straight line to success. You will find ups and downs. That's why I titled my book, Never Ride a Roller Coaster Upside Down, because all of life's a roller coaster ride. And if you had some of the crazy experiences I've had, I've had it's many times a roller coaster ride upside down. But it's being prepared to understand that you will face adversity, you will face challenges, and the successful people I've known have found that when they face adversity, they gather their team together, they roll up their sleeves, and they find solutions to the adversity. Um, because you will face it. And I will tell you that most of the successful people I've known, all of them, have, are the ones who have come through adversity, who have rolled up their sleeves, who put a team together, and have gotten through the tough times. So that's just a very brief overview of what it's like um, to own a radio station, to put a plan together, and to deal with all the contingencies that hopefully will make you successful in doing something that can be very rewarding, which is owning a radio station. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this LABF Power Session. Thank you for watching. You can find contact information for the presenters and more details about LABF and links to support our activities in this video's description. If you have any questions or are interested in learning more about any of the topics we discussed, please reach out. Thanks again. And remember, whether you're just getting your start or are already a broadcast professional, the Library of American Broadcasting has resources to help you explore the industry's rich history. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.